And oh, Kelly's a much more mellow person because she's happy with herself. You got to remember, Frank was constantly battling. I, I thought uh, if I let my wife know, uh, she she'll kick me out and I can have a life as Wendy. But I was still worried about my work and um, my family. I thought I'd lose everything if I could actually get that psychiatrist to listen and to do something about what I was saying then maybe, just maybe, I wouldn't be doing this now because I'd have already done it 20 years ago. But if Tyson Fury wants to come and fight instead of being a coward and twittering on Twitter that he wants to fight, let's go, there's half a million pounds on the table. To millions of people, he was known as the tough-talking, no-nonsense boxing promoter who led Lennox Lewis and David Hay to their title glories. No one would know that Frank Maloney was fighting one of his biggest personal battles. In 2014, Frank was gone, and the public were introduced to the key person behind the Jack the Lad persona, Kelly Maloney. All right, I know you know me as Frank Maloney, mm. but I, have, I can't help my gender issue. I can't help what I'm going through. When I came out, it was such a, a big story, such pressure on me, and pressure on my family. You know, my, my girls had to learn to accept it. Um, they were constantly being bombarded for a bit with the press, and they were just normal girls that would, you know, go through a stage of life when they should have to be carefree and enjoy their life. While Kelly's daughters became accepting of their father's news, her wife Tracy could not cope, and their marriage ended. You know, I, I mean, I know this will be very hard for people to sort of understand it, but I was in love with Tracy, and I really, and I'd done everything possible to suppress Kelly's feelings and to let Kelly come out, because I knew once I opened that lid, I could never put Kelly back, because she was the real me. I knew my marriage and that relationship was over, and it would never be the same again. Kelly is on her way to visit her eldest daughter, Emma, who was the first of her three children to discover that their dad desired to become a woman. She reflects on what it was like being raised by Frank Maloney. Yeah, she was quite a strict parent. Um, probably not very understanding. It was kind of, yeah, dad's way or no way, really. Quite highly strung, could be quite um, angry at times. When she first told me, I think it was quite relief because obviously the build up to that, sort of the previous 12 to 18 months had been really hard going. Um, Dad obviously wasn't in a good place and none of us knew why and you know, it was kind of just sort of watching something happen and not knowing what was happening or why it was happening. Unable to live as Frank anymore, Kelly was going to attempt suicide, just like a staggering 40% of transgender people will do in their lifetime. I think it was Christmas. And I think it was every, it was just everything at the time, and and I thought you know what there's only one way out of this, just end it because I thought I was losing everything around me, I I couldn't come to terms with it. I was still fighting myself, and and you're not you're not thinking straight, you're not being logic logic about things, you're actually being a very selfish person. You're actually being a very selfish bastard. My children would never, and for the rest of their life, they would live with that. Why did my dad do that? What drove my dad to do that? Dr Helen Webberley is a GP who has immersed herself into gender healthcare, believing the support in general practice is insufficient for transgender patients. She set up an online clinic where patients can ask her advice and says the community has welcomed her with open arms. We do see a lot of um, anxiety, depression, um, self-harm, suicide amongst, this, amongst the transgender community. A surprising number of older people are just thinking actually now it's time to get some help and get the care that they want. The problem is that very often these people have just summoned up the courage. So they've been trying to, for many years, summon up the courage to, to tell somebody at least or get, um, what's going on and get some help. Um, at, at the moment, you know, the free healthcare from the GP is not necessarily available because of what we've discussed in terms of lack of knowledge, lack of skills, lack of awareness, um, some kind of GP's own um, prejudice. 50-year-old Angie Brewer used to live as a man called Andy. She found a link to Dr. Webberley's website through Facebook and got in touch with her after receiving a letter from the gender clinic saying that she had a four-year wait. She issued the oestrogen and the testosterone blocker and thought, oh, great, yes, 
things are starting to move forward now. My GP won't do the same thing. The only way my GP will do the same thing is once the gender clinic have issued the authority for her to then issue my prescriptions. And so what was Andy's life like? It was a struggle. A struggle. He, he had mental health problems, he had physical health problems. Um, it was, it was, it was hard. I wouldn't even know who to approach back in the mid, mid to late 70s, early 80s, no. Back then I thought I was transvestite because I liked dressing as a woman, as crazy as that sounds now. And after three sessions of talking to the psychoanalyst, he just tried to talk me out of dressing as a girl. Coming to terms with being transgender is, is huge. There's, it's not just you're born in the wrong body, there's everything else that goes with it. There's gender dysphoria, but there's also body dysphoria as well. And some people actually hate the body and hate the bits that they've got. Dr Stuart Lorimer has been a psychiatrist and gender specialist at Charing Cross since 2002 and has seen how the field has evolved in that time. In terms of the changes that have, that have happened in the last decade and a half that I've seen, um, it's, it's been phenomenal really. People can access good quality information about transitioning, about the possibilities in a way that they never could before. Obviously in the last few years as well we've really seen trans go mainstream and that's been a mixed blessing, I think. Men are people who have penises, women are people who have vaginas. It's as simple as that. Now, the presenter of the BBC radio programme, Women's Hour, has sparked controversy after writing an article which appeared to question whether transgender women are real women. There is part of me, though, that really wishes that this would stop being the cool thing at the moment and the media would move on and just leave us. Um, because I think, I think there is a sort of um, odd celebrity buzz around it at the moment, um, which I would like to see pass. I, I perceive myself as being abnormal, some sort of weirdo, some sort of pervert. I was the only person like that in the world. Oh, I got married, I had children, but the thoughts never went away. Wendy, previously John, worked as a family doctor for 20 years before transitioning. It wasn't long before the local media got wind of the story. I always wanted to be a doctor. When I first transitioned, I'd, I'd been working for two weeks and the press discovered that I was working as a female. The GMC insisted I write to 12, our 12,000 patients. And uh, following that, I got, I, got, I got quite a few. I got about 20 or 30 letters of support uh, from the patients. Wendy had gender reassignment surgery in 2002 and says that the operation was the final step to womanhood. Before, I, I did feel as though I was a guy dressed up as a female. I had to align my female brain or my female self to a female body as well. And whilst I had male appendages, uh, I couldn't do that. This operation is incredible in terms of the effect it has. Um, and, it, and it reinforces how, extra, how extraordinarily defined we are by what's between our legs. You wouldn't believe it. There are unequivocally not enough surgeons in the UK to meet with the demand. And the same applies actually in a lot of places across the world. Treatment for gender dysphoria is life-saving because the evidence is that if you don't offer these people treatment, one in five will commit suicide. I would always support and work within the trans community to help others. You know, Kelly, sort of what she's gone through, she's needed us around her a lot more, so, um, yeah, I think relationships have been made a lot stronger. As Kim says, I'm brave, but it's not something I, I understand too well. Trying to be someone that I wasn't for 49 years was, was braver. Acceptance of transgender people has seen improvement over the last 40 years, but the rights of trans and non-binary people still needs further exploration. There's still a long way to go down this road less travelled. <laughs>